Let's welcome Wookie, who is talking about infrastructure updates and whether we can change anything in less than two years. Uh, I hope so. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? No. Well, uh, so uh, thank you for all coming back after dinner and not just going to the pub. I'm uh, impressed by your enthusiasm. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we have this interesting problem that it's quite hard to change things quickly in Debian. Now, we all knew that. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some experience I've had over the last few years trying to change a particular thing, which has not gone particularly well. Um, I, I would have liked to think we could have done a bit better. Uh, so I really do want to talk about the general problem here of uh, the way our infrastructure works and how if you miss a stable release, um, that can be a real problem. Um, but I shall use this example uh, of build profiles just because uh, that's happened recently uh, and I think it illustrates the point, or at least some points. Um, uh, I'd very much like to discuss things rather than uh, blither on for too long, so I'll try not to blither on for too long. Uh, so, uh, just to clarify, in case anybody's not clear, all of our, our infrastructure basically runs on stable. Um, there are a few exceptions to that um, for practical reasons. Um, uh, so if it's not in stable, you can't use it in the infrastructure. So um, now I've been standing up and talking about build profiles for some years now. Um, uh, just in case anyone's not familiar, it's basically an addition to the build depend syntax to be able to put angle brackets profile something uh, so that sometimes profiles do or don't apply uh, because you uh, set magic variables. Uh, and this lets us do uh, arbitrarily complicated things. Uh, primarily, in this case, makes bootstrapping easier. Uh, is the original reason we started this, uh, but we've generalized it rather and hope it will be useful for other things in future. Uh, so, because we've changed the build depends syntax, uh, tools that read that syntax have to understand it. Uh, at, at the very least, ignore it. Um, so that mostly means dpackage, but it also means apt, and it means sbuild, and we actually found 11 other things that read build dependencies themselves, rather than use another tool. Uh, that's possibly slightly too many, but there you go. <laughs> um, some of them are quite obscure, like Haskell, we don't care about that. <laughs> um, there's a list on a web page, which I did have, but I've just lost. Um, so just to give you some idea of the timeline here, so uh, 2010 uh, there was a UDS, we had an argument about this problem uh, and Leek Minier uh, wrote a spec um, for build depends stage one and build depends stage two, which was a very primitive version of this concept. Um, and I first talked about this at DevConf 11, uh, which is now uh, three years ago, and wrote some patches eventually, uh, beginning of the uh, six months later, uh, those went in, which implemented, again, this fairly simple-minded version. Uh, and then there was a long argument about exactly how this would best be done, and how what I'd done was a bit crappy, um, which was true. Uh, the deep package maintainers understandably, that because you added an extra field for every stage one, stage two, stage three, uh, it made for a very bloated implementation in deep package. Uh, so there was quite a long back and forth about should we use angle brackets and should we use square brackets and uh, you know if we used angle brackets that was the last character left uh, so if we ever thought of something else crazy we'd have run out of meta characters to use um, and this went round and round and, and to be fair I think that debate caused the final solution to be much better it's much more general it's generally a good thing however it did mean that whilst having that argument we missed the wheezy release so it wasn't stable now uh, because we were still arguing about the syntax at the point where it could have been in the stable we now have. Uh, so, uh, perf, you know, uh, it didn't seem to be too much of a big deal at the time. So eventually we get a better implementation in dpackage that everybody's happy with. Uh, we rewrite all our patches again. So by this time, basically, Johannes Schauer, my uh, GSOC student uh, of a couple of years ago, had more or less taken this project over, and he did all the patching and generally fettling things which is good because it meant it happened in a timely fashion, which it wouldn't have done if I was in charge. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so by the end of December, end of 2013, we had new patches for all the, most of those 15 packages, certainly all the important ones, uh, and we sent them in. 
And then uh, Helmut Gruner got involved and said, I want to actually upload something that tests this uh, for the very good reason that if we don't try it in the real archive, you won't know whether you have in fact found all the things you need to fix. Uh, and if any of those need to be fixed in stable so that it actually works, you need to find out before the next stable release, otherwise you're screwed for another two years. Um, so he uploaded Doxygen, because that was one of his packages, and it needed a uh, build dependency, a build profile adding to make it bootstrappable. Uh, and it got rejected because uh, Python apt somewhere in the archive software said, I don't understand this. <laughs> uh, it's not right. Throw it away. Um, so we found something that breaks. Fair enough. I've supplied patches for that. Uh, well, we already had patches for that. Um, but the problem was, how do you get that into the archive? Now, uh, by this stage, as I say, I wasn't really pushing this. Now, the point, unfortunately, Helmut and Johannes, are, neither of them are here. Um, but we did have a sprint last week, so uh, I talked to them about this. Uh, so they were basically me trying to make this happen. Uh, they're both smart people. Um, I think Helmut's a DD, Johannes isn't yet, uh, but only because the AM process is very slow. Um, now, uh, they decided to mostly do this on IRC, uh, or Helmut did primarily. Um, I suspect that was a mistake. Um, there's, a, there's something in a process somewhere about if you want to have a stable release update, you should file a bug about it. Um, so we didn't start by doing that, uh, or they didn't start by doing that. Uh, they started by asking people, going, is it okay if we do this? And is it okay if we do this? Um, which is kind of informal and polite, and it, you know, it's polite to ask people whether you do something before actually doing it, perhaps. Um, but I don't think it actually helped their case, particularly. Anyway, so, yeah. They did try reasonably hard to get this done. Uh, so we had all the patches written. So the point about this was that they weren't trying to get all the functionality of build profiles into the old stable release, just enough to be able to ignore things with angle brackets correctly so it wouldn't blow up. Uh, and the point is that anything that gets used in the infrastructure needs to not explode when it sees some angle brackets uh, and just ignore them. Uh, and then we can upload stuff and test things. Uh, so they tried uh, putting something in Wheezy proposed updates, but the stable release manager didn't fancy that much. Um, and there we go, okay, well maybe we could put it in backports. Uh, yeah, backport the new version of dpackage which has all this functionality in. And they went, nah, that's, that's whole loads of new things um, as well, which we don't want. Um, how about just uh, a patch to do, just ignore angle brackets and not do any of the extra functionality. So we had some patches for that. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the original patches we were trying to get in were just to ignore angle brackets, not to implement the whole thing, because clearly that would be wrong in a stable thing. It was the, it was the least possible patch that would let this pass through, was the idea. Um, and. Uh, so there's some rules about stable backports, and uh, that didn't comply with those. Uh, we thought, all right, how about just, just stick these in quietly somewhere so they get used in the infrastructure in much the same way as the version of S-Build we use. It isn't actually the version of S-Build in stable. Um, uh, but um, I think people didn't like that much either. Um, and yes, so, and then there was a bug filed, which basically said, uh, so eventually it said, dear tech committee, can you help? What should we do? Um, which again, perhaps wasn't the smartest move, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, so everyone involved was very helpful and polite and reasonably said, well, our rule, you know, what we normally do is this, and this doesn't really comply, so no, we don't really want to do that. Um, but the problem was that we couldn't even upload something to Experimental to try this, and it seems to me that we probably ought to have been able to do that. Um, so. Does that mean that collectively, so, so each individual group, kind of the, the stable release update people said, well, you know, this isn't really a stable release update sort of thing. Uh, and the backports people said, well, this isn't really a backports sort of thing, um, and so on. And, and they all had a point, uh, you know, it's easier for us to say, no, don't do that, because, uh, well, it is. Um, easier and more correct. It's and, and, and ar ar arguably correct, exactly. Um, but the, the kind of the collective result of all these individual groups going, it's not really something we want to take on the maintenance burden of, is that we couldn't do this for months. Uh, we still haven't done this. 
Now, as it happens, at the bootstrap sprint, we found a bit of a problem. So actually, maybe we want to change it. So maybe this delay is a good thing. But uh, in general, uh, it would have been nice to be able to try this a few months ago and go, yes, this all works, and we have all the pieces. Um, now, so one question is, in fact, was all that IRC chat the wrong way to go about this? And someone should have filed a bug at the beginning and had a much more public discussion. Uh, I think they probably should. Um, there's a bit, if you read all the bug reports about this, there's a bit saying the, the, the stable release update people said no. And they said, we didn't actually say no. We just said, nah, not sure about that, which isn't quite the same as no. <laughs> um, Yes. Uh, so, you know, to some degree, that's perhaps just communication failure rather than... But, you know, on the other hand, these two guys are smart people who, you know, know how the project works and, and did fairly sensible things. So if they didn't do the right things, then maybe it's hard to do the right thing. Um, arguably, you could say that, in fact, we don't want to introduce build profiles in the thing, and you do have to wait another two years, and that's just tough. Um, I don't know. How much do we want this to be discussion as opposed to you have one? I'm, I'm almost finished. So, um, so yeah. Uh, can we improve on any of this process? Uh, so one of the things I hadn't appreciated four years ago was just how much it matters if you miss a stable release. There's something you need in. You really do have to wait quite a long time before you get another go. Um, and I'm not sure, and maybe I'm just slow on the uptake, and everyone else realized this years ago. Um, I'm sure Steve has. But, uh, uh, yeah, you know, if I been more aware of that, I would have worried a lot more about the fact that we missed the wheezy opportunity to get this in. Uh, well, I really wasn't sufficiently on the ball. Um, so all of these people write to go, well, there's a small risk this will break something, so we don't want to do it. Um, because, you know, the version of dpackage that people are using in, say, a stable release update really does matter. So, you know, people are right to be quite conservative about that. Um, now, you know, Helmut went asked the tech committee, kind of, oh, help, I don't know what to do. Um, some people think that that's really not a nice thing to do. So uh, Guillaume, for example, hates the technical committee. Um, and when, well, no, you know, that's... <laughs> it, it's worth noting that the... Yeah. Yeah, not to interrupt right before you finish, but it is worth noting that what he actually did was to informally engage tech committee members in an IRC conversation. Exactly, yes. Which is really not the same thing as invoking the technical committee. Precisely. Right. Um, but it's still a noise gear. Yeah. <laughs> um, so bike sheds, obviously PPAs is something that maybe we should be using more to uh, enable this sort of have some software in use for the machinery, which actually isn't in stable. Um, we already do that, in fact, for several packages, and maybe we could do it for more when it's expedient. Uh, that's approximately what we do for the same kinds of things in, in Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and it works fine. Mm -hmm. uh, all you need, is, so I, I totally understand the need for admins to have the thing maintained somewhere. Um, and, you know, it's, it, that's, that's not always necessarily something that you want to push to Debian users. There are kits where we want to be running something different, but you want to make sure that the, uh, that the thing you're running on important production systems is actually cared for by somebody mm -hmm. and having it be have you know the Debian Deepakages team uh, team's name on it uh, and have them be able to push security updates and that kind of thing and have them be on the hook uh, is I think sufficient for this kind of thing yes so anyway, that's the end of my slides so if there's I think other people closer to where the mic is in the <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, so um, from my perspective, the first thing that went wrong in this particular process, um, I was always of the opinion that, that Loic's um, original proposal, regardless of any lack of aesthetic desirability um, from Deep Package Upstream's point of view, mm -hmm. um, it was the right thing to do Sufficient. because it would have gotten us where we needed to be. And so I think it was, mm -hmm. I think the original sin here was in, in um, letting Guillaume derail it um, by going for the perfect solution, which necessarily meant it was going to take longer to implement. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I did voice this opinion at the time you did. That, of that discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we could have gotten there a lot faster by being more pragmatic about it. That's um, true. 
but that was a decision that the people who were working on it needed to make, and I was not the person working on it, and so Indeed. that's that's fine. You I'm, make whatever you decision you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, in the uh, you know the knock-on effects of that, um, yeah, as as Colin says, if we picked one thing to overrule here, it would be the SRMs is most likely. I I, I tend to agree with that, but we were in the situation which. I viewed it as something which, in in the absence of of any particular group being willing to stick their necks out and and take on this work, um, there needed to be somebody in the project who did have the the big picture view about what Debian as a project needed, as opposed to what the individual teams needed, and that is supposed to be the technical committee's responsibility. Mm. Um, so I actually I asked uh, I think it was I don't remember if it was Helmut or Johannes at the moment, but I did ask somebody to assign that bug to the technical committee. Now. In the meantime, we discovered that, oh, maybe the conversation they had with the SRMs was not what they thought it was, and maybe the SRMs wanted to review it, which is why the technical committee didn't act on that. The other aspect of it was that in the course of discussing it, it was pointed out that as a consequence of everybody now being a delegate on these teams, um, the technical committee doesn't have the authority to overrule them. And so we have, no, have a bug here that I don't think, it, I think it's an emergent bug that we don't actually have the authority in the technical committee to overrule delegates on technical matters like this. And I think that's something we should probably constitutionally fix because it is, we, we've used delegations a lot more than we used to, and so this is, I think this is an unintended consequence, right. and we should have a project-wide discussion about whether that should be fixed. Obviously, all things being equal, we should have an amicable discussion and consult people anyway, but sometimes an overrule yes. might be needed, and there should be somebody with the power to make those calls. Um, Right, so you, you can overrule individual maintainers, but not but teams the moment, now. Yeah, but the moment the team gets a delegation so that they're blessed by the DPL, then suddenly you can't right. overrule okay. them anymore. I don't think, I certainly hadn't realized that. I guess a lot of other people hadn't either. One thing that occurs to me is um, perhaps you were trying to solve the wrong problem. <laughs> uh, quite possibly. Um, because it, if you think about the way this would be managed in a sort of corporate environment, uh, if you're, you're, you're were basically trying to test the existing, infra the tools that are used in infrastructure to make sure that you'd caught everything. Yes. And so the solution to that would typically be set up the infrastructure. To be fair, that's what we were told to do, uh, ultimately, right. was go and set up your own copy of everything and test it there, which, as you say, is a perfectly correct way of looking at it. The problem is it's really hard to set yeah. up our infrastructure because it, half of it's not packaged. Yeah, um, well, but perha perhaps... Puts us off, rather. Um, that's actually not true. Is that it's not true? Okay. It's really hard to set up a complete copy of DAC and as build and all that. So okay. DAC and as build's not horrible, but... Microphones. <laughs> What's the wiki thing that gives me step-by-step? Step yeah, I think... Do yeah, I'll, you, I'll write one next year, but... Um, <laughs> so, any, anyhow, this, this, this actually, for their specific case here, um, saying you can set up parallel infrastructure is ignoring half of the reason they want to do this. It's not about testing that it works in the archive. In fact, it wouldn't because the D package they want to upload will ignore those fields and the infrastructure will not in any way be improved to support these features. What they want is to be able to upload packages to unstable that support build profiles so that when unstable becomes stable, you can bootstrap it. Yes. That's what they want and well, there parallel infrastructure I mean, doesn't solve that there was, there because was they'll never be able to upload that stuff to unstable until a stable release has happened. Yeah. So then we're back to there's, this. There's well, finding now that we have a two-year delay. Forgotten about is one thing and also, as you say, having maintainers be able to upload stuff which currently does nothing but you know, is ignored but will be useful in the future. So the problem with doing that is that because you you haven't set up the parallel infrastructure is that that code has es effectively never been tested. Mm. And using our production infrastructure for testing new code is probably not the best idea. Isn't that what experimentals for in this case? No, because you're not testing ex no, you're testing the infra infrastructure. Right. Okay. What we need is a, what we need is a staging master not a, not yeah. a staging yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we we need both. We need we need to have a for this kind of thing. Uh, if you want to have a way to, to exercise the infrastructure without risking the integrity of FTP master, then what you need is a separate staging instance of FTP master that people can upload stuff to, and that it will that will be published. Sure.
so we're kind of going down into the, the specifics around particularly build profiles and yeah, the talk is actually in general bring this about back the, to the general overall feel thing. free that's so one one comment i kind of wanted to make on the general overall thing is, is that uh, i my experience you know my experience having done a large uh, debian based uh, debian based infrastructure at stanford was that there are going to be things that you're going to want to customize or tweak or fiddle with that are not in uh, Debian that are not in Debian proper whenever you have large infrastructure and I don't think that Debian's infrastructure itself is any different than any other uh, enterprise environment running Debian in that there will be things that Debian's infrastructure itself will want to tweak so apart from the problem of the code not being tested I, I, I there's a trick we use at Stanford where we would have a private uh, apt archive not only just private to us but where each role of service had its own specialized distribution inside that apt archive, and you could upload packages targeted at stable-ldap, and only the ldap servers would see those packages, which let, get you, it gives you a little bit of flexibility to expose packages with custom tweaks to only a particular part of your infrastructure without risking pulling them into other places that where they may not be appropriate. And I don't know, uh, Tal can probably comment on what you kind of mechanisms you have for doing those kinds of overrides already, but we found that mechanism extremely useful at Stanford in unblocking little problems like this where you need to put a custom hack on a particular set of machines you still wanted the whole packaging infrastructure around that with upgrades and everything else but you didn't want to expose it to all the other systems you said canonical does exactly the same thing okay so um Yeah, and another uh, another case for the general problem is cloud images. Uh, I'm I'm at Google right now, but it also applies to Amazon and every other cloud out there, as well as private clouds like OpenStack. It's not just the public clouds where everything is changing at a faster pace than the two-year cycle, and maybe you want to integrate with the the host environment, get some bit of metadata, um, or access some API, uh, and you know, if 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 we if we uh, put a version of a tool into Debian, like assume no licensing issues. If we put a version of the tool into Debian before freeze, then it's already halfway through its lifetime at a, you know as of the release. And then you know at some point we have to convince people to pull things in from backports to uh, you know keep things up to date. So and similarly, some of the settings that are great defaults in uh, a local workstation environment. You know, may not be suitable as a default for the cloud. Uh, so there's a lot of settings and features that need to be added sometimes. So it seems like, again, we're focused very much on Debian's infrastructure here as one possibility for things that block us from making changes in less than two years. But there's a related problem also about apt and dpackage and similar where there's a certain class of in archive changes that we can't make for a couple of years because first that dpackage and apt in stable have to understand them so that you can upgrade mm -hmm. i'm wondering if solving both problems we might want to say well our packaging infrastructure as awesome as it is that it can upgrade itself maybe we should pull the packaging infrastructure out make it a little bit special and say hey it can upgrade itself in a way that it does so first and then parses the rest of the packaging method metadata for unstable or next stable then we could upgrade whenever we feel like it <laughs> certainly as you say i think if it, sometimes you want to be able to upgrade the package and apt first and we've, yeah. we've, we've basically done that by telling people to do it in the readme before I think I don't know if we have a mechanism obviously canonical does so I mean there used to be a, a I forget what it was called but year it was years ago it was like potato era that we had a, a special archive that you were supposed to upgrade the tool chain from before upgrading the rest of the system um, lost the thought um, so just in general with with this kind of infrastructure problem we're talking about here you know, th this was actually, in fact, very narrowly prescribed, where the only compatibility issues there would be between stable and unstable would only be in parsing of build dependencies, which the average system doesn't need to do at runtime. Yes. Um, and you could, you could simply was, say... It's very likely to be fairly harmless for that reason. But. Right. And, and sure, there would be compatibility issues and people might be trying to build stuff, but then you could just tell them, ah, here's the, the stable release update, the stable updates uh, package that you just pull in, um, and you could do that. But even that, we've found, is, has been difficult to do for a variety of reasons. 
Um, I'll cede the floor to Colin now. Uh, just uh, going back to, to Josh's point, the, uh, for, for a succession of Debian updates of various kinds, we've had uh, release notes that had a, a procedural system for performing the upgrade uh, in various cases. And that's obviously been as varied as the types of changes involved, uh, scaling up to anything like the libc transition of your, um, or A.HL. Um, and uh, when we were when we were thinking about this for Ubuntu upgrades, we uh, sort of had the the idea of executable release notes. I don't know if uh, if Michael's in the audience, but this turned into the uh, the release upgrader that we that we use in Ubuntu. Um, and the the idea of that is that you have a blob that the upgrader fetches from the archive that knows how to upgrade to a particular target, um, and that's procedure may involve going and fetching a different set of packaging tools from somewhere else. But it, rather than having to ignore bits of metadata, uh, you have all of this happen before you even look at uh, the, the next set of uh, index files at all. Uh, and you, can, you have the opportunity to, um, to install whatever preparatory tools you like. Uh, and I would love to see something like that in, in Debian as well, although it's a lot of work to maintain. So in particular, if we have something like executable release notes, there's no good reason that they need to be limited to a stable release only. <laughs> we should have incremental steps, much like uh, database incremental upgrades or similar, where you say, to do this upgrade, you need to apply this thing outside of the packaging system and outside of any particular package, and just run it, and then you can proceed to read the packages file. But apt would need to proceed to do that before it can go read packages.gz or similar, so that if it needs to upgrade its parser to handle a new version, it can. And we could incrementally apply, you know, upgrading from stable to stable might involve 27 individual executable scripts and upgrades, but that would mean, for example, we would never have a problem again, like how do you upgrade from user doc to user share doc without a five-year plan? Okay. Does that definitely work? <laughs> I guess I'd like to bring the discussion back to the earlier point about staging of infrastructure because, uh, you know, regardless of what we might do with upgrader scripts, we still in some way have to solve that problem of how we get these changes in. Um, and, you know, obviously the right answer is that we should have a staging server, but I would like to ask, you know, in general, I guess I would view that as whoever is running the production service should kind of have a staging service where they can stage the stuff and it's does does uh does dsa does ftp master today have a way to do that should it really be the the responsibility of every individual who who wants to patch it to provide the staging infrastructure now obviously you should test your patches before submitting them but shouldn't there be a way to test those in an integration environment before being pushed into production anyway and don't shouldn't that be something that's that's handled centrally i, mean, I guess there's two Thing. As you say, we, we could probably just better document the process of setting something up yourself. So, you know, uh, Tolliff says it's not actually that hard. He's probably right, uh, but, you know, it, it seems like a scary idea. And, in fact, if it turns out it's not that difficult, just telling people how to do that, maybe it already is, you know, there's a page somewhere. Um, uh, that would be... Well, we've yeah, been that directed... Would, that would help a lot if, you, if that was, in fact, straightforward. Um, we've been directed to read... read actually, actually, maybe we should back. run something ourselves anyway, and then it's easy to try. Um, you do get the kind of experimental problem that you've got 16 different experimental things in it, so it might all be a bit broken. Um, Which is exactly why you want an integration branch before you push it out to production. Uh, okay. Is that what you mean by a staging branch? Yes. Right. Well, we, we're using um, a staging implementation. The because we're putting software from development onto staging. So staging is running the tip of all the different projects that it's actually managing to run. And then we um, wash that for a week before it actually goes through to a production release. But the problem we're getting with that is, yes, it's fine for the developers who are interested in these kinds of problems to submit um, uh, data to the staging instance. 
but that isn't real data. It isn't actually what's going through the, the, the production instance. And you end up with corner cases, you end up with failures and, and sort of um, a false assurance and therefore bugs in production that simply because the data you're putting through the staging instance isn't a mirror of the data that's going the, through the production instance. So you would need to actually then make sure that, uh, in Debian's case, it, it might actually be easy to do that because then you could just mirror incoming and making sure it's going through. But it's just making sure that you think about that as well. Because if you're going to have a staging instance, it's got the data going through it has to be the same as the data that's going through the production instance. Otherwise, you've got an invalid test. Okay. Although in this particular case, you explicitly want to test some other things, but I guess you could test those as well. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, as you said, it's pretty easy to test that in Debian's case. You would mirror incoming or have the FTP uploader actually upload to two places. Uh, to answer Steve's question about staging infrastructure, uh, we generally don't provide that unless people ask for it. Uh, we do have quite a bit of free capacity, so uh, a full extra copy of FTP master is probably, it's doable, it would kind of, like, it would stretch a bit, uh, but doing kind of a reduced scope FTP master is absolutely not a problem. Yeah, I guess that's the question, is how much resource does one need to set up something fairly realistic? Uh, so the, the big problem with FTP master is really the, the size of the archive mm. um, in terms of, I'm not entirely sure how that big is nowadays, but I'm guessing it's growing on a terabyte. And so that's expensive in terms of actual disk space, but nothing else. So You don't necessarily need to do all the architectures. A couple might suffice for test e purposes. Yeah, exactly. So you've given me an opportunity to beat on the drum that I was I actually started beating on in New York, which is that all of the questions about how we do this in Debian aside, uh, those people out there who are running um, Debian and want to include some local packages um, all run away from DAC screaming because no one has any idea how to set it up or how to run it. And if someone could document how that stuff works, you would solve problems for so many people outside of Debian. I mean, really, you would be a hero to just explain how do you start from scratch and set up DAC and a build D network, and there would be numerous enterprises that would love to have that. How many people know that? <laughs> so we need to stop them being quite so busy. We need to go and volunteer to do their jobs for like, I don't know, a couple of weeks. Well, it, well, it, it would be easier to find people to help them if it was documented. Ah, yes, indeed. I mean, actually, I, so I discovered setting up buildies that, again, that's quite fiddly uh, and not very well documented. So I wrote a page, which is slightly half assed of course, and now we've got the old page and the new page, which don't quite agree with each other. And I was talking about doing it for Debian ports, and they were talking about doing it for Debian. So they don't. And now, of course, you really want to merge those into the definitive version. Um, but uh, yes, so I did a bit of that. Uh, I guess if I could be persuaded to actually try and set up a thing, I'd write down what I did, which would be useful. But I still wouldn't necessarily understand it. So a uh, smattering of random points here. To your point about uh, staging and the size of it, um, in theory, you could throw away all of the packages in the archive as you were setting it up, because the only things you're actually testing are the infrastructure, and you care about the packages files being valid and so forth. And the actual contents of the archive, you could process once and get rid of, and that would be perfectly fine for a quick staging thing if space was a concern. Uh, second, um, we do have one member of the FTP master team here at DevConf uh, this week, Paul Tagliamonte, mm -hmm. so we should find him and talk to him about whether he wants us, well, Is whether hiding they want a staging um, setup. Uh, and again, to the point about ease or difficulty of setting up DAC, um, it, there seem to be a variety of opinions here. Um, I think people who have done DAC setup need to understand that a README setup that tells you how to set up DAC is not the whole picture. And it's not the quality of documentation that we're usually talking about when we're expecting random people to be able to, to bootstrap themselves into a thing. You know, there's unless there's a linear series of these are all the things you have to set up. Mm. It, th and I, as far as I'm aware, we're not using DAC out of packages for the archive. And so even something as basic as where do you find the right 
software you're supposed to be running is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and these are all things that if you expect people to be able to get a, get their minds ha get a handle on this stuff, there needs to be a clear set of steps that, that anybody can follow from it, start it, to it end. It may well be that most of the off-puttingness is just that it's not, you know, it's mysterious rather than that it's actually difficult. Uh, well, the I've uh, so I've operated DAC. Uh, I have also independently several years later tried to set it up from scratch. Uh, so, I mean, I in theory know what to do. I know the conceptual steps involved. I still couldn't do it. Uh, it's not that it's it's not merely a problem of lack of documentation. Um, at least as of mid last year, as far as I can tell, it was not possible to set up the database from scratch given the. That's given the Git branch, that's always been my the, the database that's schema did not exist outside that, production as far as I can tell. that's the thing that's always made um, of packaging impossible, well, is, is, is what Mr. Kern tells me. But what I, was, what I was going to carry on to is that this is exactly the kind of problem that you solve by having a staging server which is not operated by the developers. Uh, you, you must have your staging server be operated automatically, uh, in such a way that in order to get changes onto production, you have to have the your schema changes in Git properly. Uh, otherwise, they can't happen. And otherwise, it's way too easy for this kind of thing to creep onto production just because of perfectly normal people doing what by they need to by do. By the developers, you mean the DAC developers? Yes. So somebody else needs to thingy and... So I, I guess I'm a little bit naive here, but um, I was expecting that most of our infrastructure can be set up simply by running Puppet on a new blank server somehow, and it just magic happens and things work again, so that if our hard drives break or asteroid crashes the building that runs the server, we can get it up running again in a day or so. So maybe that's not true, but if it were true, um, that might solve the problem for people who want to contribute. They can just run the same deployment scripts and maybe modify them to change host names um, and get the thing running the same way it's running on our systems. And I've had a quite a few instances where I wanted to change a little thing at some infrastructure, um, in this case dead bugs, but I couldn't test it and the amount of effort it takes me to find out how to set up an instance and how to test it is just thwarts the benefit from this little but still useful change. And um, if, if all our infrastructure were um, reproducible. deployable, reproducible in a change route or in a Docker instance these days, I guess, mm -hmm. within one script or one, one command, um, I'm sure we get a lot of nice little patches for various annoying things. Uh, I think you're quite right. I want uh, Wookie told a bit before about uh, buildies that are not easy to set up. I think one of the problems is also related to Puppet in, in Debian. It's very great that everything is integrated in Puppet. You can set up uh, a build daemon in less than one hour now. But at the same time, uh, a user wanted to set up a buildie doesn't have Puppet. It doesn't get the, 